if something is really short term, I do think and I do believe that uh, a lot of people can do that. Mm -hmm. So if something requires, I don't know, one minute or one hour, uh, I'm trying to deprioritize that because I do know that it's going to be millions of people on earth who will be able to do the same thing. But if, so, if, if I have something which requires years of my life, I do know that there's very few people on earth who can think in, in, in 5, 10, 20 years terms and will dedicate his or her life to that. So I know that I'm, I'm in less competitive territory and I know that I'm thinking long term, which means that you know the impact of my actions is going to be really big. Sergey Young, thanks so much for joining us on the show all the Hi, way from Sean. London. Yeah, so happy to be here today. Yes, and not to be mistaken with Sergey Brin, founder of Google, who's also <laughs> working on longevity projects and taking moonshots in exactly. this world, right? Exactly. Yeah, I think our wealth is just have, you know, probably a thousand times difference. But um, this name was actually pretty helpful. So every time you go to like San Francisco to the Bay Area, when, when you can present yourself as Sergey, uh, oh, like Sergey Brin. So it was, it's, it's quite a bit of door opener for me. As well. Yeah, it's, it's a I'll name that you can't me. really forget, you know, in, especially in San Francisco. Exactly. And with, with family name Young, you know, mm. I, I think it was just pretty determined for me to be a big fan of longevity and uh, adding few healthy and happy years uh, to everyone's life. So that's, that's the other story derives from the name. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm very excited to dig in with you. You have such a fascinating history of working on interesting things. Obviously, you're you have the you're currently on the innovation board member of X Prize. Yeah. Uh, you previously managed a uh, a private equity fund of, of two billion dollars. Yeah. And now this new f- project that you're not project, I would just say, but this new venture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This new vision that you have is the Longevity Vision Fund. Um, talk to us a little bit about the story behind of what inspired you to start something like yeah. the Longevity Vision Fund. Good. Um, well, where do I start? Um, well, let me start you know, from my childhood. Um, all of my friends always had a passion. For some, it was collecting you know, postal stamps. I was born in, you know, in the years when it was possible. Uh, some of them, they, they were like, uh, they like fishing, you know, going outdoors and God didn't give me the passion until the age of 43. I'm 48 now, by the way. And then, uh, it was interesting. So I had successful career, but it was nothing really fulfilling. And then in the age of 43, I went to the doctor and they find that I have particularly high cholesterol level. And they said, well, Sergey, you need to take drugs called statin. And I said, well, I'm cool with that. So, well, is it for one month, two months, three months? And they uh, said, no, you don't get it. Um, you're going to be taking this drug till the rest of your life, until the end of your life, which at this time I thought just another 40 years. Right now, you know, I want to live 200 years. So I have another 152 years ahead of uh, uh, in my life. But so I, and I was scared. I felt... Uh, uh, my life is just, you know, starts to fall apart. Just imagine yourself living on a drug every day. So I asked the question, like, is there any alternative? And uh, alternative was changing lifestyle, changing your diet, um, changing, you know, your supplements regime, your physical activity. And apparently I did all of that in the six month and it was so successful. The quality of my life just went up. And uh, I was full of energy like today. And, um, and I started to share my experience with people. And I, I got a lot of positive responses. And I also invested quite a lot in, in just understanding my health and taking back control of my health from you know, different agents like food producers, big pharma producers, 
um, insurance companies. And, um, and because I pushed so many friends to go through health checkup, because early detection of killer diseases is the most important things, you know, thing in life. Um, so you just start receiving the calls like, oh, Sergey, you pushed me to do this you know, kind of cancer scan. Apparently, you know, I had a cancer. It was early stage. I'm fully recovered. Yeah, and thank you. You saved my life because without that, I would just wait for stage four mm. and uh, it will be recoverable. And frankly speaking, once you receive few, you saved my life words from the people, you just... I mean, you, you, you're you really on the hook. You couldn't think of doing anything else rather than bringing the positive change to the world and bringing, bringing positive change to the lives of people. So then I thought I need to extend life and bring healthy and happy years to one million people. Uh, then I met Tony Robbins. I met Peter Diamantes, my good friend, who is founder of Singularity University and XPRIZE Foundation, living in Santa Monica, um, California. And, um, and Peter said, well, Sergey, one, why million? Just shoot for billion, right? You're gonna <laughs> so be doing this, yeah. You're going to be doing the same things, right? It's just small incremental effort. So your mission should be somewhere around 1 billion lives. So my, my today's mission, I want to change 1 billion lives in this world by bringing affordable and accessible version of longevity and digital healthcare to add few healthy and happy years to everyone's life. So that's that what drives me. Yeah, and it's certainly a big vision. I definitely want to go into the mental frameworks and some of the mm. questions and processes that you right. have that allowed you to think big. And mm -hmm. certainly one of those are hanging out with guys like Tony Robbins and yeah. Peter Diamandis. Um, I want to go just before that, dig into a little bit about how you were able to raise money for the longevity fund. Obviously, yeah. there aren't a lot of funds dedicated for right. help uh, for supporting longevity technology and science. So why is the case that there isn't a lot of competition for, for, for people mm. like yourself out there and that mm. there isn't a lot of capital being put into work yeah. to support these uh, causes? Well, interesting question. So, well, let's, let me start with the broader one. Why we don't have longevity industry in at mature stage today. So just think about you going to Walgreens or CVS and try to ask them for anti-aging drug. They would think you're crazy or they would send you to cosmetics or they would send you to supplements, right? And there's a big reason for that. Uh, the problem is that uh, aging is not considered as disease today. I mean, we all know that your age-related disease, which are you know, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, neurogenerative disease, right, um, increase exponentially with the age. So if you're above 60, your chances to get them 10, 20, sometimes 100 times more, right? But if you look at you know, our regulatory framework, aging is not disease. So that's why I couldn't really invest my money into fighting aging because then I will not have intellectual property rights for the drug that I develop. So that's why I will not be able to pay off my investment. So that's in very simple terms why we don't see anti-aging drugs in our pharmacies. And that's why there's just not a lot of people, you know, putting their money into that. So all we do now is we try to live in the current regulatory environment and uh, try to do small things. And hopefully with, with the help of technology, we'll just develop something which would um, help to extend our lives. So, so the problem number one is we need to change regulatory framework. Uh, so that's one. On the other side, um, a lot of people really want to live longer and healthier and happier lives. So that's why I thought rather than reading kind of newspapers or you know, doing a social media blog on longevity, what if I can raise $100 million and support entrepreneurs who want to change the current state of healthcare, who want to bring the, the latest development in artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data into healthcare, and in the end of the day, will just improve everyone's life. 
because the beauty of, of you know, making technological solutions that it, you just arrive to very affordable and accessible version of you know ultrasound devices or cancer scans or early cancer detection or you decrease the cost of organ transplants for like factor of 20 or 40. So you, you just help a lot of lives and it's economically viable. So that's why we develop Longevity Vision Fund as a digital healthcare fund, but with a focus, with a dream and a mission to bring longevity to the world. So that's that's the story. And obviously there's so many people who would like to, would like to give back to the world. So think about the current well, it's people who are on the top of the wealth list. They have tens or you know, sometimes even hundreds of billion dollars, but their consumption patterns are not the ones that we've seen kind of 50 years ago. 50 years ago, where you buy a castle in France, you buy big yachts, you buy you know a huge house you know in Beverly Hills. Well, that's pretty much it. Well, the, the new generation of wealthy, successful, you know, people, uh, they want to change the world. So look at what Elon Musk uh, is doing with Neuralink or with SpaceX, Jeff Bezos with, you know, his space exploration dreams and undertaking. Uh, so that's why it was actually relatively easy to raise this hundred million. In fact, I raised my first 50 million in the first five minutes conversation. Wow, it was as, as what was the easy, pitch like for that? that? You know, obviously um, it's the results of me working 20 years in the investment industry. So I know exactly, you know, how to present the case, where the opportunity is, how we need to build our investment portfolio, what kind of startups and entrepreneurs we need to work with. So in a way, this five minutes is just, you know, it's it's built on 20 years of previous experience, mm. but nevertheless, fundraising part was uh, pretty easy. The most difficult part is still cherry pick and find the companies who would, in addition to bringing the change to healthcare, would also have affordable and accessible component of this change. Because I, again, remember my mission is to make an impact on 1 billion lives rather than changing the li or improving the lives of few very wealthy people in this mm. world. Absolutely. And do you think it's also a, the fact that now investors are more open to this idea of backing in this specific case, digital healthcare companies, is that, are we kind of at this tipping point where there are certain trends in favor of making these technologies and science a little bit more affordable? So one example is like the Moore's law where computational yeah. power doubles every 12 months. You know, the smartphone that we're holding yeah. today yeah. is a million times cheaper than a supercomputer from the 1970s. Exactly. Uh, and it's a thousand times more powerful. So is it also trends? Are we at a tipping point now where, you know, there could be some opportunities where capitalism kind of coincides with longevity as well? Yeah, exactly. And I do think that, you know, I call it three horizons of longevity, right? So the first horizon is what you can do today to live longer. And today is not, today's solution is not, you know, really technological so you just you know do your health uh, checkup every year you don't smoke you change your diet you know possibly implement you know take some plant-based or lab-grown meat uh, and fish uh, you change your physical activity profile and you have peace of mind right which is meditation sleep act of kindness well we do invest in the other horizon called horizon two of longevity and this is the technologies which you currently in early stage of development, but will be available to us in the next 10, 15 years. And this is where we invest for Longevity Vision Fund. Typical examples of these technologies like uh, gene therapy and gene editing, regenerative medicine, which like stem cells, mm -hmm. or different organ regeneration technologies, or dev of use of artificial intelligence in early cancer diagnostic or in drug development. So that's this is a very exciting technology. But to get the benefit of them in the next 10 years, you need to stay on longevity bridge. You need to work every day on just retaining the healthy and happy state of your body and mind. So then in 10 years time, when you have an opportunity to use this technology, your, body, your mind and your body is actually worth um, uh, extending its, its resource in mm -hmm. a way. 
So that's that's exciting horizon that we invest in. And then the third horizon is um, is a visionary one, is a really long term one. And I'm I'm looking at this with combination of fear and excitement. So this is like future of humans. Horizon three is human avatars, uh, either robotics or uh, digital ones. Uh, we're working a lot on that, just trying to dig into the space to invest uh, just a small portion of our capital there. Or you know different organ replacement and, and and futuristic organ regeneration techniques, Internet of Body, nanorobots flowing through our bloods and fixing the problems inside our bodies, uh, making you know just downloading our mind you know, scan in the, you know in the clouds and, and and there's just so many exciting or just linking our brain with artificial intelligence right similar to what Elon Musk does in Neuralink. So this is I mean this is all really you know, down the road. This is in, you know, 20, 25, 50 years from now. But it's exciting to see how the small elements of it is is coming to today's life. Yeah, I mean, you've seen Elon Musk's presentation with uh, this beautiful Pix, you know, who has this uh, amazing chips integrated in, in their minds. Um, mm. Or uh, I, in the last um, two months, uh, I had a discussion with at least four uh, human avatar companies. And I can tell you, human avatars is actually much closer to us than we think. And, what do you mean uh, by human avatars? Just to be yeah. So basically, you have two options to for human avatars to to have a copy of yours. So one, you can have like a robot, uh, similar to what you've seen in Avatar movie done by James Cameron and Peter Jackson and uh, uh, other talented guys. So you have you can have like a robot, you know, who has an opportunity to see. Uh, feel uh, and you know take all the other information in the external environment and translate to you um, uh, in the different forms or it can be digital avatar when we use artificial intelligence just to reproduce the digital copy of ours in a digital world and the reason we still didn't invest it in avatars is uh, um, we're still hesitating whether the future will will be more around just building robotics copies of us and like sending them to Mars and yeah. for us to be able to feel, see exactly what they, you know, feel and see, smell and touch, or we just all migrate to the digital space. And, uh, and that's the, uh, easiest way. Again, this is futuristic. Again, this is five to 10% of our fund. We are much more practical. We want to help people today rather than uh, to help them in 25 years of time. But that's exciting to see this development. I even had an opportunity to get to know the inventor of human avatar concept. Uh, it's this Dr. Tachi from Tokyo University. He invented this back in 1980. Uh, he's still alive. He's energetic, friendly man. And uh, at this time, he called this concept um, uh, teleexistence. And he still refers to avatars as, as a teleexistence uh, solution. <laughs> well, I think it makes sense. The fact that, I mean, this is kind of what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink is mm -hmm. he has a vision of the fact that in an instance, we can implement a chip and humans can learn yeah. pretty much anything yeah. in an instant. But that's the vision. But yeah. the initial portion of getting the product validated is to address some of the more immediate functions, which is helping people that may have disabilities or uh, solving some of the PTSD issues that some people may have. Exactly. Um, exactly. And uh, just to add on that, we already outsource a big deal to our smartphone, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I can remember probably one or two phone numbers, you know, of my mom and my wife, right? So, but the problem is we just, we're using very inefficient interface, like our eyes and the audio, to communicate with this outsourcing device, right? Mm. So uh, nevertheless, we can you know, talk about this uh, forever. It's a very exciting topic. Well, I, I'll speak of excitement from the contrast perspective. You said you have a mixed feeling of fear and yeah. excitement. So where, yeah. where does the fear part come from? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, first of all, um, fear is very natural, right? Fear was built inside our body by mother nature. So we can, it's just part of your survival mechanism, right? So it's not unusual for us to, to have fears about the future. What I'm afraid of is, um, what if we all move to the digital world? What we, what if we all lose the opportunity to, you know, smell the grass, 
to have a glass of wine with the loved ones or with our friends or, you know, take a hand of our kids and go with him or with her and bring uh, them to school uh, or, you know, smell the ocean and look at the sunrise, etc. So I'm really uh, afraid. My fear is that we will just lose our natural ability to be in the world and enjoy the world. So that's that's one. Well, the other thing, um, the, the, the more uh, we will be able to extend our lifespan, the closer we are to immortality. And I'm not a big fan of immortality because I do think if you take out the death from the human life, that um, uh, we'll just lose something very important. We'll just lose something which is you know, super critical for human being. So, you know, I do believe we'll be able to help people to bring more healthy and happy years in their life. But the, our life cycle will still, you know, still give us an opportunity to be born and to die and then try to make the big positive difference to the world and to ourselves within this time frame. Do you think immortality is something that you foresee as possible? I've always seen mm -hmm. a lot of the recent technologies and sciences working on helping humans maybe live to 150 or yeah. perhaps 200. So extending lifespan, yeah. but the idea of immortality, does that come from the fact that technology is moving at such an exponential rate that if you can live to 150, by then the technology is gonna catch up so yeah. that you can live to Yeah, sure, it's called longevity escape velocity, basically, which means that by the year that you kind of spend on Earth, technologies has been developed to help you to do a traversal for this year. So that's that's the point in the future. This concept has been invented by David Gobel and Aubrey de Grey, the, the, Aubrey is father of gerontology. But um, um, what do I think uh, about immortality? So I do think that we, we immortality is uh, not possible in the next uh, probably 100 years or so. And I do think that the way the immortality concept is going to be realized on Earth is your series of life extension decisions. So think in very simplified terms, you'll reach your 100 and then you have an option to extend your life by another 10 years or so. You know, obviously, you know, become younger, healthier, healthier uh, uh, and happier. Uh, but it's not like you're going to be just biologically mortal till the rest of you know, until the universe will collapse then a uh, zillion years from now. Mm. Um, so that's actually bring us to a very important topic. If, if it's going to be your decision to extend your life, are we ready to make this decision? Because the only uh, very small cohort of the people who make this decision today is, is thinking about committing suicide, right? Uh, am I ready to just, you know, make decision about my life extension i'm not sure so that's that's the other concern right we just need to we will need to change our mindset if we will reach the point of you know technical immortality when you every 10 years you would need to decide where you're going to stay on, on earth for another 10 years or not again in very simplified terms but if you look at the uh study figures uh, and two studies has been done in actually in us and in uk at the same time only like 15% of people would like to be immortal, even like with our currently very limited uh, understanding of what immortality can actually mean in 100 years from now. You said 15% want to be immortal? One, one five, yeah. Would, okay. So the question was, if you would have an opportunity to live uh, forever, would you take this opportunity? And then only 15% of people said yes. Then if you rephrase the question to if you would have an opportunity to extend your life to a few, uh, like 10, 20, um, another years, would you take that? Then one third of the people is actually up for it. And I do think this is, I mean, this is a pretty low numbers. We usually, we, you know, I'm, I'm tend to be positive on, on a number of things. I'm a super positive person. I always thought that it's like longevity is a dream of hundred percent of people on earth. Mm. Well, it's not. Uh, and and the reason being, it's a huge wake-up call that we need to change this world before we embrace the idea of radical longevity or even immortality, 
right? You know, think about there's so many dilemmas there. The dilemma that um, I mentioned to you, whether we're going to be like, well, I, I will have emotional capacity to make decision to extend my life or not, right? This is super difficult decision. It's, yeah. For me, it's just impossible to make. Or, you know, what about our collective responsibility? Today I can throw, I mean, obviously I don't do that. We can throw plastic in the ocean and then, you know, leave it for our grand grand kids to sort it out. Am I ready or are we ready to live with the consequences of our act irresponsible actions and what we need to do to bring collective responsibility on this planet? Or what about social different social constructs like marriage? If I'm going to be living 200 or 400 years and two thirds of marriages collapse today in the US in the first seven years, you know, what 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 about the marriage as a concept yeah would it be more kids based partnership or any other form of partnership and mutual responsibility and joy uh rather than something else well is or, the idea of hmm? like the is the idea of having kids is is that even going to be a question because okay. as the idea of being able to live forever it, it brings this very issue like macro issue yeah. which is the idea of overpopulation we already face a lot yeah. of climate change yeah. um you know as you mentioned the marriage system people if they want to if most people live to about 80 today uh 75 80 and that like as you mentioned marriage is already yeah. a difficult issue but imagine spending yeah. 130 or 500 years yeah. with someone yeah. it's uh, <laughs> yeah it's a yeah. very big issue but for a obviously lot of people. it's a different undertaking yeah yeah, and, and there's so many, or think about dic you know, dictators on this world. Think about people of North Korea. What if they will be stuck with their beloved leader forever? Well, that's, yeah. I think it's a terrible, you know, things for them. So that's why I do think before we, we will embrace radical longevity or immortality, there's so many things that we need to change in this world or gap, you know, between poor and, and, and rich. You know, mm -hmm. it's just widening all the time. Nations becoming more and more divided. So that's why I actually think longevity is much more unifying uh, theme for me and the opportunity to recombine, regroup and, uh, you know, join the effort with the most, most positive people on earth and to bring, you know, health and happiness uh, to, to our population. Yeah, and, and maybe we are thinking a bit ahead. You know, I think I, we also had Aubrey de Grey on, and he, he was just saying that mm -hmm. like the first step, when that opportunity comes, when that technology is available, yeah. we'll figure that out. That's, you know, 50, 100 years ahead. And talking exactly. about it may, may not make the most sense. But, uh, yeah. you know, one thing I did want to go over with you, Sergey, is just the idea, the concept of thinking bigger and going mm -hmm. for moonshots you know you've had you're, you're very good friends with Pierre de mendes of course yeah. and he was telling a story at the singularity opening mm -hmm. where larry page was speaking to a group of people uh the students within the university yeah. and he yeah. asked how many people in the world do you think are working on something that could change the world and he just answered it for them which yeah. is 99.99999 percent of people are not working on yeah those things yeah. yeah so why do you think based on the people that you've met and the people you've spoken to that people aren't taking more moonshots and thinking That's bigger question. yeah uh well a few few considerations here I, I mean it's an interesting question i don't have a ready answer but um one i think with um what has happened in the world, specifically in the last few decades or even centuries, um, we narrowed down our definition of success. And, and the current social paradigm, and it, it should be measured in number of dollars, which you have, uh, you know, in your bank or in your wealth, um, uh, which you measured uh, when you uh, used to measure your wealth. So that's why I do think that we, um, unnecessary super focused on the monetary uh, value. So that's why, you know, rather than combining the effort, people are looking at life as a competition, right? And competition is a zero sum game. You don't work on expanding the field, you're working on taking the share from someone else. So that's, that I think is, is our mental problem there. Uh, so that's one. 
Uh, number two, obviously, uh, with specifically with with the arrival of social media, um, we've been socially conditioned, right? Because the picture of success uh, that we draw from um, social media is pretty unified, right? You have kind of few celebrity or star models that you follow, and then you just try to, you know, reproduce it in your own terms. And I think life is much more diverse than the role models that we all kind of love and like and, and see in the, in the social media as well. So that's second. Uh, third, world became much more short term. So before inventing smartphone, our attention span was 15 seconds, one five. Uh, you know, after invention of smartphone, our attention span is eight seconds, right? Mm. If you think about the goldfish in the bowl, it actually has nine seconds attention span. So my attention span today is actually lower than attention span of the fish in the bowl, <laughs> right? So true. Yeah. So and obviously, changing the world is a very, you know, long term requires a lot of long term thinking and and the long term horizon. So naturally, we've been wired to our gadgets to leave the world in eight seconds periods mm -hmm. and, and time slots, rather than you know taking time to reflect and thinking about big things and thinking about the world. So that's that's my. Uh, few um, thoughts on uh, on why we actually um, have less and less people today who are thinking in a, in a huge world terms and trying to change the world rather than focused on their own wealth or you know building their own career or success on their own. I mean, it's not that bad, obviously, mm -hmm. but obviously I would love to have more visionaries more people who uh, share sharing themselves with the world uh, than we have today. And I think, and finally, I think we forgot the one of the main uh, you know secrets of this world, that uh, which is um, whatever you share with the world will come back to you uh, multiplied by so many times. So, and I've seen it a lot. So, you know, I'm sh I'm. I'm, I'm trying to be the best version of myself. I'm trying to share as much as possible in the world. And frankly speaking, the world pays me back. You know, I have amazing people in my network, people who surround me, my friends, my role models. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm actually, I'm so happy I made this positive change in my life. And I changed my mission from trying to protect and be, be you know, build the wealth and security for my smaller family. And I expand my definition of the family to the you know, whole population of our planet. Sure. Yeah. And I even see you doing this as well during our talk. You're proclaiming your vision of wanting to increase the longevity of a billion people. You've, I think you've said this about four to five times just in this conversation alone. So you, yeah. you have this intuitive instinct to really proclaim that vision because of, I guess, previous experiences of this going back to you. Um, but yeah, it's, that's, that's a very interesting comment. So if you have your bold vision then that means that it's it's just becoming your thought filter. So, you know, every time I have an opportunity to do something, you know, I'm, I'm asking the question, you know, would it help me to, to um, build my uh, and, and execute on my mission? Would I have an opportunity to reach to 100,000 or, you know, million hearts and minds? So that's actually very helpful to keep it in mind and proclaim it all the time because it does help you just to concentrate and to focus and therefore to become much more successful in, in uh, you know, building this huge change. Yeah, absolutely. And, and maybe it's, uh, it's difficult to know why other people aren't taking those bold actions, but for you specifically, just because of how big of moonshot you're taking with this fun and the previous things you've accomplished in your career, mm. are there any questions or quotes or even mental frameworks that mm. you ask yourself to avoid incremental thinking and to go bigger and to think and to think in moonshots? Yeah, 
Yeah, um, so I'm a big fan of uh, the book called uh, Essentialism, uh, written by Greg McEwen. I had an opportunity to interview um, him for my book. So my book called The Science and Technology of Growing Young is going to be published uh, July next year in US and UK. Then it's going to be translated to many languages. So what I'm and um, I mean, he has a lot of amazing ideas in, in this book. And uh, I'm always asking myself, um, is what are the one or two big things that I want to accomplish today? And with the perfect realization that it's very unlikely to be, you know, the whole change, the I'm, I'm not going to reach the final result, but, you know, small incremental efforts that I can do every day towards my bigger goal is uh, super helpful. So that's one. Well, the other habit that uh, you have is, uh, um, I think it was Warren Buffett who had two phones. Uh, I, I, look, I might be mistaken, but it's one mm -hmm. of the prominent investors in this world. And I'm pretty sure it's Warren Buffett. He had two phones. He had a phone for incoming calls and he has phone for outbound calls. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So if you think about this filter, uh, whatever is, uh, whatever is, uh, is demanding your attention from external environment is very likely to be against your mission because it's very likely to be like a small thing or, you know, is, is not, is not going to be priority or it's going to be priority of the other man or the woman. Uh, and, and this would be fine. But the problem is with certain period of life, you receive so many demands. So then you like, I mean, you just need to sort out, remember this guy in circus who just kind of, you know, make sure not all the plates, you know, mm -hmm. uh, plates should be, you know, spinning all the time. Yeah. Uh, so you just becoming the victim of external requests all the time. So that's why it's very important to have your own time for the outbound time for activities which derives here in your heart or here in your mind rather than trying to respond to all the demands from the external environment. And you need to have a balance. You obviously, you cannot go to the cave and just, you know, working on your own stuff because you want to bring the positive change to the world and the world is full of people, right? Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, if you will be able to have at least half a day, like four hours, uh, for your own activities, for your own priorities, I think it's uh, uh, super helpful as well. And then, and then, final thing: um, if something is really short term, I do think and I do believe that uh, a lot of people can do that. Mm -hmm. So, if something requires, I don't know, one minute or one hour, uh, I'm trying to deprioritize that because I do know that it's going to be millions of people on Earth who will be able to do the same thing. But if so, if I have something which requires years of my life, I do know that there's very few people on earth who can think in, in, in five, 10, 20 years terms and will dedicate his or her life to that. So I know that I'm, I'm in less competitive territory and I know that I'm thinking long-term, which means that, you know, the impact of my actions going to be really big yeah i totally agree with you i think i think going 10x bigger uh and maybe this is peter thiel that also mentioned yeah. this as well is is so important and actually logically more effective because then going 10 percent bigger because you're just going to face less competition so yeah. elon musk trying to go into space yeah uh, is going to face way less competition than trying to someone someone trying to start their own restaurant or their exactly. shopify exactly. store or anything like exactly. that exactly um, but those things, as you mentioned, come from the ability just to think and have time for yourself. I think uh, Jeff Jeff Weiner, the CEO of LinkedIn, was talking about how he actually purposely schedules blank time in his schedule yeah. for 30 minutes yeah. or an hour yeah. where he just literally just sits and thinks and lets boredom kind of influence his creativity and his new ideas. And he tends to do that on a daily basis and it's where yeah. a lot of his best ideas come um yeah. and helps yeah, it's, him. Called TT, it's called tt in my calendar thinking time oh and how is there like a 30 minute block for you on a daily yeah, basis 30 minutes, uh monday wednesday friday and what do you do during that slot 
Yeah, I'm like, what, so what you do is just you sit down, your table should be empty. You need to have a piece of paper and, you know, any writing device. I don't use my phone for that because you, you immediately you'll just get, you know, get notification from one of the messengers or email and you just going to write the things that you want to write about. And usually it's just kind of sense of priorities where you stand against your priorities, your dreams, your mission. And, uh, uh, you just go in, you know, not in the flow, but, uh, in, just in your own thinking, what are the three things that needs to be done today, this week, this month, or this year? Gotcha. Yeah. Journaling is, uh, is, is definitely one of the most powerful things that I feel all innovative leaders have in common. Uh, from Richard Branson uh, yeah. to to Jeff Bezos, uh, are there any other? Just because you you hang out and you you're yeah. constantly interacting with some of the yeah. biggest, yeah. most bold bold thinking leaders yeah. in the yeah. world, are there things that you've learned that or patterns that you've seen that all of these mm-hmm. leaders have in common to think mm-hmm. bigger or be more effective? Okay, okay. So a um, few things. One is um, the art of saying no. Sometimes uh, they have pretty direct style of saying no. Some of the people like uh, Yuval Harari, the author of uh, you know many famous book, has just amazingly friendly style of saying no, but they all say no. Because if you say yes to something which is not critical and not priority, that means that you just took a time and effort and resources from your mission. So they super selective what they do. And I'm trying to kind of do the same. Mm-hmm. So that's... Uh, that's one. And um, second, if they spend time on something, they really do total immersion. So it's not like they're with you, but they just taking this call and they just reading this article and you know, communicating with someone else. If they are there, they they really there. And um, uh, I think it was almost like two years ago, we went to Vatican with Peter Diamantes and Tony Robbins joined us for this three days conference on regenerative medicine and, and life extension. And <clears throat> obviously I knew Tony really briefly before that. And Tony always said, guys, you know, take a lot of uh, notepads and take the notes when you study something, right? Mm-hmm. This is super important. And I thought, I mean, obviously it's, it's a good habit and it's great that Tony says that he does it all the time. But I never sincerely believe that he's just, you know, take it at, at the book value. You know what? This man, he spent three days on the first row. And he's a really big man. On the first <laughs> row. Yeah, I mean, he had like, you know, five books that, that he had written. And he was just, for the every uh, guy on the panel or on the conference, he was just like looking at him like this and making... You know, making notes like crazy. You can totally and visualize thought, that. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I can. You know, I always thought it's just you know a little bit of you know exaggeration, exaggeration, and you know, he does that. But uh, it, but when Tony does that, he really does that. So it's total immersion. Is uh, I think it's um, pretty important. And then the other thing, they they always full of uh, different you know, people, resources around them. And and this is not, it's not about, oh, I'm wealthy, so I can afford to have, I don't know, assistant, you know, great team there, great team there, there. So every time they need to do something, their first question is not how, but their question is who. So they're very resourceful. So every time you, you're like, oh, okay, so I want to do this, this, and this, and they're like, okay, I don't know the answer, but I know amazing guy, you can call him or her. They will spend like 30 minutes with you. They've done it a thousand times. And they obviously full of kind of secrets and ideas how this can be implemented. So the level of resourcefulness is, is amazing. And this is against how we usually live our life. Because every time we face a problem, we're like, okay, I need to solve it. You know, let me think, how do I solve it? Rather than... So rather than being resourceful, we just becoming much more internally focused and trying to invent the uh, wheel. And these guys, they didn't do that. 
So yeah, this is probably the three most striking habits that I've seen and I observed and I'm trying to to learn from uh, these great role models. Yeah, and one thing to add to that is, is because of these guys of how resourceful they are is is it's it's baffling to me how how valuable they are in terms of how much value they give to each interaction, mm. each relationship. It kind of brings me exactly. to this book uh, from Adam Grant. I think he wrote it with Arianna Huffington, Give and Take, where mm-hmm. he did an, an analysis of there's two types of people in terms of uh, that you'll meet professionally, which is the people that give more than they take. And then there's people that yeah. take more than they give. Yeah. And yeah. when they did a study of those people, generally the people that give more, whether it's more ideas or connections or, or introductions or ide- yeah. whatever it might yeah. be, those yeah. tend to be the more successful people. And, and what I've seen at least is the most successful people tend to give more to other people, and which is why exactly. they have all these resources exactly. they, can, they can go to. Exactly. Exactly. And this impressed me a lot when I, you know, I, I'm surrounded by amazing role models. And this is what they do. Every time I'm like, oh, I'm thinking about this. I know one guy. Let me connect you with her or with him. And uh, you'll take it from there. That's amazing. Yeah. So to uh, to end off, Sergey, and I really want to do a, a round two on this, but I know you are short on time. There's so many things that I uh, wish we got into. But to give people some actionable advice and takeaways after listening to this, how can people listening be more involved and, and participate in the, in the future of longevity? And and more importantly, how can people take more moonshots? How can people think bigger? Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, on moonshots, I think understanding that it's actually super exciting and fulfilling uh, to give more than to take it's it just amazing principle to embrace and take into your life. So if all of us just make a habit to share the best with people, to give them more than we try to take from them, this will change the world. But more importantly, this will change your life. You're going to be richer, healthier, happier, and more successful. I know it's it's counterintuitive, It took me years and probably decades in my life to learn that and embrace that. But that's uh, super important. So that's one. Two, we're going to live longer. You know, half of the people who born in Singapore today, I was just looking for Singapore's figures uh, last week, are going to live to 107 years. Wow. 107. Um, So we just need to understand that we're going to face more and more consequences and outcomes of our irresponsible actions. So it's time to be responsible. It's time to change the world. It's time to unite our effort to make the planet just a better place, right? So that's uh, that's second. And third, on longevity. Uh, when I have 30 seconds on longevity, I give people advice to do annual health checkup. It's super important. I can talk about this for hours and weeks and I can talk about for ages uh, but well that's super important so you know make sure you're uh, in the good doctor's hands every year uh, to prevent the most dangerous diseases in this world um, and then finally uh, we just need to understand that we in, in today's society we outsourced so many our health related decisions to other parties so Food producers decide what they should put in the meat that they sell to us. Uh, supermarket chains decide whether we're going to be eating organic or non-organic tomatoes or cucumbers, right? Uh, Big Pharma decides uh, what kind of drugs we should be taking. And or you know companies who produce sugar drinks try to push us to you know drink more sugar drinks why you need to have a balance. So I think it's just, we need to realize that. And it's time to take back control of our own health, right? Listen to your body, make sure your body is in in good shape. Make sure you eat healthy uh, and organic food. And I've seen a lot of studies actually switching to more plant-based, like fresh vegetable-based diet 
is actually saves you from 500 to to 1000 dollars a year mm. run and go for some expensive but unhealthy options so it's time to learn about how our body works that our body has self healing capabilities built in by mother nature that a bit of exercise you know healthy eating and meditation and act of kindness will change our lives will change of the people whom we love and will change the world beautifully said and beautifully ended sergey where can people find you online where do you want people to go to learn more about what you're up to and who you are perfect um the easiest way to connect with me is is to go to sergeyyank.com sergeyyank.com sign up for my newsletters and we'll take it from there we have a exciting program my my book is coming in the next 11 month for and i have beautiful amazing content plan to share again longevity is is for me is the act of sharing so there's no paid content there at all it's all for free there's just a lot of infographics about longevity health exciting technologies and what we can do for ourselves and for our loved ones to be healthy and happy Beautiful. Uh, well, we'll have to have you back when that book comes out to, uh, to promote it to our audience. Thanks, Can't wait. Thait. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank thanks so much for listening. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'll see you guys next Cheers. week.